Hi, I'm Ted Nelson. Introducing Computers for Cynics, Part Zero, The Myth of Technology. But first, are you a dummy? If so, get out of here. There are thousands of books for the likes of you. But if you're a clever, sophisticated person with, who'd like to know where the bodies are buried and how the computer world really works, perhaps some of the insights I'm trying to present will be of interest. The computer world deals with imaginary, arbitrary, made-up stuff that was all made up by somebody. Everything you see was designed and put there by someone, but so often we have to deal with junk and not knowing whom to blame. We blame technology. That's the main thing I want you to understand, as you consider the thousands of methods, thousands of products, the fanaticisms, the hopes and dreams, the apparent possibilities, the grim reality. This will draw in part on my books. Computer Lib, 1974, often called a classic. Geeks Bearing Gifts, <laughs> which, Brewster K which Brewster Kale, the founder of the Internet Archive, calls the best computer history book ever written. I'm sitting in his chair right now. And my memoir, Possiplex, which tells of 50 years of misadventures in the computer field. I call myself a software designer. Now, what you may ask, what software have I designed? Well, there's only one thing that I designed that you're familiar with, and that is called the back button. What's that you say? It's obvious? Yeah, it's completely obvious. But in 1967, it was obvious to only one person in the world, and I had to fight for it. So that's what this series is about. The ideas and fights beyond, behind what laymen call technology. Technology exists, but it's like marital fidelity. There's a lot of it, but a lot less of it than people think. And often what people call technology isn't. I don't understand technology often means something like, I don't understand the crappy menus of this stupid camera. People often say, you can't argue with technology. Of course you can. All kinds of junk is foisted on the public in the name of technology, but you have to know what else is possible. And not be misled by packaging. Part of the myth, thinking that packaging is technology. Here is an iPhone. An iPhone is not technology, it's packaging. Microsoft Windows is packaging and, and, and conventions. Microsoft Windows is packaging and conventions. The Macintosh is packaging and conventions. The World Wide Web is packaging and conventions. Underneath these wrappers are the real technologies, TCP, IP, and DNS, graphical display and bit blit, uh, audio digitization and compression, payment mechanisms and encryption, and on and on and on. But the wrapper is what people see, as with pretty girls and dashing men barely guessing what lies beneath. Now, the greatest myth of technology is the myth of determinism. The belief that technology is determinate, objective, inevitable, that the nature of computers is given. It ain't so. It's all been imagined up. Now, many people think God created the real world, but no one that I know of believes that he, she, or it created the computer world, though many act as if they think so. Key example. Why can't you put marginal notes on a Microsoft Word file or a PDF or a web page? Oops. <clears throat> Why can't you put marginal notes on a Word file or a PDF or a web page? The naive answer is because computers don't allow it. And the real answer is because, <laughs> because Chuck Simone and John Warnock and Tim Berners-Lee didn't think you needed it. Yes, it comes down to individuals. If computers were determinate, you could get the same answer to a thousand... Pardon me. <laughs> if computers were determinate and you gave the same assignment to 100 programmers, you would get the same result every time. <laughs> uh, on the contrary, no way. If you gave the same assignment to 100 different programmers, you'll get at least 75 different methods. It's all very personal. Everyone has passionate ideas and ideals and wants to create software to fulfill those ideas and ideals. Passionate people like Kim Thompson and Dennis Ritchie when they created Unix. Passionate people like Richard Stallman when he copied Unix to make GNU the free version of Unix. Uh, passionate people like 
Linus Torvalds, when he put the maraschino and cherry in the middle of GNU and created Linux. Uh, unfortunately, Torvalds got, gets all the credit for Linux, whereas most of it was Richard Stallman's GNU. Anyway, while the great doers have been mostly men, let me also mention Ada Lovelace, the first theorist of software, and in our time, Kate Compton, the creator of a crown to hold your uh, iPhone above your forehead, to give you a virtual reality, a, a, an augmented reality headset, brilliantly minimalistic. There are so many ideas to care about, and with ideas come the politics of ideas. There are thousands of computer ideas, and so there are thousands of computer religions, that is, ideas people care very much about. Every faction wants to pull you in. Uh, Word, PDF, Mac, Web, <coughs> every, every faction wants you to think they are the wave of the future. And because there are no objective criteria, as in religion, there are no objective criteria, there are thousands of sects and splinter groups. Like dog breeds, there are thousands of different computer ideas, and like dog breeds, they can be endlessly combined, making millions of computer ideas. The concepts go on and on, and many of them have fanatical following. What are the computer principal computer religions? Oh, Microsoft, Apple. Linux, open source, venture capital, program, provability, and God knows what else. Specific languages, everyone has a favorite language and they, they're fanatical about. C++, Perl, Python, uh, Ruby, PCP, C Sharp, uh, Lisp, but which Lisp? East Coast Unix versus West Coast Unix. C Shell versus Born Shell versus Corn Shell, I won't even try to explain that. Particular conventions of punctuation have fanatical adherence. Like I refer to the true brace style in C. Object-oriented programming has many fanatical adherents, and then so do specific methods of object-oriented programming, like, uh, and then on down to the Booch method of decomposition for object-oriented programming, I kid you not. All of these have their believers. So who gets to decide? Who gets to decide what methods will be used, what ideas will be followed in creating software? Ah, that's the politics of the computer world. The computer world, the politics of the computer world are about who gets to design, that is, decide what the product will be and what's in it, make up the constructs and the mechanisms, decide and polish the presentation and the interface. Everybody thinks they can design great interfaces, and almost no one can. These decisions are determined how? By some objective mechanism? Ha, ha, ha. That's politics for you. They're determined by fighting and jockeying and internal politics and maneuvering in, in projects and in companies. Trying to get leverage, and everyone's trying to get leverage and creative control. Now, in Hollywood, they have it down to a system. They, have a, they, they determine who directs, but everybody understands that everybody wants to direct, and it's an issue they call creative control. In the computer world, everyone wants to design software, but they don't call it creative control, but it's exactly the same. In software, it's the same issue as in Hollywood, but nobody recognizes it. And that's partly because interactive software is really a kind of movie. What is a movie? A movie is events on the screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer. What is interactive software? Events on the screen that affect the heart and mind of the user and interact and have consequences. So what's the difference? Interactive software is a movie plus. And that means it needs a director. A director who can fine-tune all of the effects. But for political reasons, this almost never happens. I can think of only one direct director who fine-tuned all the effects of software, and that was Steve Jobs. Because he had the political clout to do it, and the taste and judgment as well. But as long as the industry thinks that software is technology, <laughs> do not, the process will not improve. Google only hires, quote, software engineers, so do not expect their interfaces to get better. Behind most of the designs, there are fights. And the more you care, the bigger the fight. Consider the history of computer alphabets. First, I mean, let's just start in the 50s. First, there was BCD in the 50s. So BCD, binary coded decimal had eight bits for two characters, and the two characters were, pardon me, six, I'm, I'm screwing it all up. When they got to extended binary coded decimal, you had two, two numbers, which were four bits each, 
or one seven-bit character. So that way they pack either two decimal digits or one seven-bit character into an eight-bit uh, byte. Now, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? So along comes, along come many proposals, but along comes especially Bob Beamer with the ASCII committee and created, creates the ASCII code, which is much more sensible. Every numeral gets its own eight bits, and every character gets its own eight bits, and they have 256 of them, and, uh, and uh, it gets accepted after a great deal of political fighting. Okay. And that was passion of Bob Beaver. He fought and fought to give us ASCII, for which we were all grateful. But then what happens? Well, in Europe they said, hey, our characters don't fit on there. We have all these doodads on our, on our, uh, on our alphabets that don't fit in your 256 characters. What are we going to do? So ASCII was kicked over to Europe and called ANSI and became the European standard with all the doodads on the characters. And, and characters. And so that was another political trip. And uh, then in, Euro in Asia they said, hey, what about us? We've got thousands of characters. Hey, how many characters are there in the Japanese alphabet? No one knows, but certainly tens of thousands. So <clears throat> the, co the techie committees get together and they, they assign, they, first of all, they say, all right, we're going to go to 64 bits for, for every character. That'll take care of, care of everybody. Won't it? So they allocated a certain number of characters to each language in the world. And then the bloodletting began because there weren't enough characters for the cultural history, for all the writings of Japan, Korea, Thailand, <coughs> They, uh, uh, Vietnam, they all, uh, they all uh, lost characters, smashing the history and literature of these different cultures. And, of course, the techies said, well, that's progress. So was the Unicode mess technology? No, it's culture politics masquerading as technology. So technology is a mask worn by all kinds of political parties and all kinds of fights and situations. So-called technology is also about capture, getting permanent customers chained into their seats. Everybody wants to capture you, either for money or to get you into their computer religion. So the babel of conflicting methods, techniques, enthusiasms, and conventions is also designed to entrap and tangle and entice for either religious or commercial reasons. Capture worlds, I think that's the, that's the term I prefer right now, but we could also call them platforms, or monopolies, or prisons, or Venus flytraps, or there's that nice term from espionage, honey traps. Anyway, your software choices are like any addiction or religion. They want your loyalty, and they want your money, and they want you to think like them. Or even if they're idealists who don't charge, like Richard Stallman and the Stallman cult, they want believers who will swell the ranks. The computer world is composed of techies, schemers, and sheep. Also a few hymnists, of which I try to count myself. The techies see more possibilities. The schemers try to build and combine, often not knowing the possibilities, and the sheep just choose one from what they see. The ones who get the farthest, of course, are the techie schemers, like Larry Page and Sergey Brin and John Warnock. But the media don't quite get these distinctions. For example, my favorite example is the movie The Social Network, which presented Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, as a, an ironic but semi-autistic nerd. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> is a fencing champion who speaks fluent Latin and Greek. So much for your stereotypes. Nobody knows where the world is going. The future is just starting, as always. And now is the knife edge between past and future. Which way the knife will twist into the oncoming universe of possibility the media are now encouraging a new fattest world of five phones and Twitter and YouTube with all this great, great stuff that's free for everybody. But ancient Rome, they say, went downhill when the illiterate masses expected everything to be free. Bread and circuses, pod at Kerkensis. Will today's freebies take away our freedoms, or will it be? Will it all be more and more sweetness of life? Thank you.